bit about the organisation. Here's Greenwich Cooperative Development Agency. Hands up who's heard of us. Yes, that's fantastic. GCDA, we we're a not-for-profit organisation that's been in the borough for about 40 years, um, running all sorts of community development projects. Uh, my colleague Gary, big hand of who yeah. has been a star in helping to organise this evening. He runs our community centre here in Kidbrook. We also have a community centre in Woolwich, at Woolwich Common, another on Power Street in Woolwich, Woolwich Front Room. And of course, many of you may know our shop, Made in Greenwich, which sells the work of about 110 artists and makers. And that ladies and gentlemen, this is where I first met Victoria. So I first met Victoria when I was teaching sewing and I had an email from a curious young woman who said, I make fans, can you teach me to make fabric fans? <laughs> and I thought, well I'm not entirely sure if I can do that. Um, but I'd love to meet you anyway and so Victoria came along to my beginner sewing class and um, that's when I was first struck by Victoria's talents. Roll the clock forward a couple of years and um, GCDA received some funding from Greenwich Borough Council to run a Black History 365 artist project. So I put a bid together with a colleague and we won the funding and that was to support three outstanding artists and uh, we put it out as a competition, and Victoria replied. There were lots of people who put their names forward, and Victoria and two other women were selected as our Black History 365 artists for 2023. I was absolutely thrilled that Victoria won one of those positions. She's an absolutely fantastic creative artist, I am in awe of Victoria, her determination to bring to life not one, but two endangered crafts. So she's an absolute ambassador for fan making, which I knew nothing about before I met Victoria. And I've learned a huge amount about this incredibly interesting craft, its history, and I love the way that Victoria is taking it into a new, modern era. And then she's coupled that for our <coughs> artist residency programme with marbling, which I had also known very little about. So Victoria, first of all, welcome and congratulations. Mm -hmm. I ask you first of all, what made you think about fans. Why did you go for fan making? First of all, good evening everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming and thank you for this interview time. Um, I think it stems back for my love for travelling. So after I had finished my masters, um, I sort of saved up some money and with my siblings, friends, I travelled across France with family members, um, Italy, Malta, Spain, Portugal. And I would always think of how can I sort of use up my uh, Euros? <laughs> <laughs> and so I would always get a fan um, as a souvenir. So I've actually got a small collection of lace fans, tortoiseshell fans, and I just loved it. And when I travelled to south of Spain, I saw flamenco dancing and ladies dancing with fans and I fell in love with fans, its culture and I just, there's something, the beauty of it, the practicality of it and I had studied musical theatre a few years before and I was introduced to props on stage and of course fans, you know, is a, is a prop that's used, Absolutely. period dramas, burlesque on the theatre because I, I love I'm trained in musical theatre as well and so I just thought this is a really really interesting mechanism that has so much history 
And just by looking at a fan, it tells you about the people, society. So I've always appreciated its beauty as well. I love, people who know me very well know I love accessories, hats, scarves, and fans fall under that as well. So there's several reasons, but I think traveling and seeing fans abroad was what started me off by collecting them and being interested. And what about the business side of it? Because being an artist is one thing, and having met your sisters here this evening, I can see that you're all a very talented trio of women, and your mother, Mercy, who's done the beautiful <laughs> thing this evening, obviously come from fantastic, fantastic heritage. A very powerful, creative trio of women. Uh, but you know, the artist side is one thing. You, you describe beautifully how you got into fans. But what about the business side of it? How did that? Yes. How did you find setting up a business? Very good question. So after my masters uh, in performance and creative research, I signed up to the Heritage Craft Association of Great Britain, their newsletter, and they were sort of alerting us all that a list will soon be released called the Radcliffe Red List of Endangered Crafts in the UK. Wow. And they said, look out for this list. And I thought, oh, this is going to be very in an interesting read. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I looked at the list, I saw fan making. It's, it, at that time, and still to this day, it's a very long list, all types of crafts. And something in me said, that's for you to do something about. Mm -hmm. You know, you're delegated, that's your job, that's your task, to do something business-wise about. Because the seriousness of this all is that there is not really an endangered crafts list in any other country, apart from the UK. And we have talent here. We have a very rich history that we should be proud of. Absolutely. And I thought going down a business route of it and teaching the craft, getting it to people of all ages, abilities, backgrounds, walks of life, and to make it something, to break that taboo that it's just for women, for instance. And having a business, you can actually do that. Set up workshops and really, as you say, take the craft into new communities, people that never really saw, oh, I can do fan making as a hobby, as a workshop. So to have it as a business makes it available to have people come and try the craft and make it fun, therapeutic. So it was very important to me that because the craft is endangered on that list, start a business there needs to be a business behind whatever I'm about to do with this. Absolutely, yes. And, and I love, you, you talk with such passion about it. It's almost like a calling of some sort, that actually this is a vehicle for you. Fan making, your creativity is a vehicle for you to reach out into the community and actually touch the lives of many people in different ways. Would you say that's a part of it? Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Because the journey has been incredible. Um, I have taught fan making to people in care homes, residential homes, and they have really, when I've met them again, because I do like to go back and visit, it's like an outreach thing I, I do, they say, do you know what, we remembered that day. We remembered you came in, they remembered what I wore, they remembered that it was raining or if it was sunny on that day, and over the sort of recent months this year, I'm now fully qualified to teach and making to people with dementia. Oh, congratulations. And reminiscence. Amazing. Reminiscence. Um, and so one of the um, courses that I did was to see how can the fan bring back memories for people with dementia? How can they recall and it's been fan, it's honestly, it's been wonderful. Are you about to say it's been yeah. fan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fantastic. <laughs> and you remember things about like going on holiday, even just in general, receiving um, gifts, whether it's Christmas, uh, um, Easter, 
and we design fans and just designing their memories and using the fan as a canvas to design their memories on and then they keep it. There's, there's so much we can do with the craft, but we need somebody with the enthusiasm, the love for the craft, but ultimately, Mary Jane, you have to love people. It comes from that loving of people first. I think that's what has really helped the outreach side of the business of what I do. Very important to me that people encounter Fan the Glory Vittori and they come away positively transformed. Yes. Very um, important. Yes. And it's, it's, so it's, it's absolutely about the fans themselves, but it's about so much more. Victoria, just to, to sort of focus a little bit on today uh, and the exhibition you're going to be having, not only at Kidbrook, but also at Made in Greenwich. Room, and I will share the dates, um, I'll share the dates shortly. But just talk us a little bit about the process that you use to create your marbled fans, because you've got beautiful pre-made marbled papers, and then you've experimented with different types of marbling and different techniques to produce some beautiful results. Can you talk us through those different techniques a little? Well, as I'm growing and evolving as an artist, and I have this wonderful opportunity to have an exhibition, I thought I've got to up the game and do something new with the craft. So everybody sort of is getting to know that I do fans, but do fans in a different way. So I thought, as paper marbling is also endangered, why don't I marry the two together? Not many people know it. So paper marbling is endangered. Fan making is critically endangered. So that's why we have the theme, marbled arch, the pun. <laughs> Marble arch, marbling the arch, which is the shape of the fan. And so I wanted to spread a newfound awareness in a creative way that we have these two endangered crafts, yet they work so well together. So I thought, because I collect pre-marbled papers, I've always done that. Before I knew it was endangered, I love collecting pre-marbled papers. So the four designs you saw are four of my favourite pre-marbled papers. And you will notice there is one very similar to the Nigerian flag. Is that the green and yellow? Yes. The green and white one? Yes, yes. <laughs> so just that 365 and connecting it with my heritage there, sort of subtly. Um, so you see four of my favourite pre-marbled papers on traditional sticks. These are sticks that have, these are fans rather, that have many sticks. And then I thought I need to actually try marbling myself. So you will see there is a section of fans that have marbled paper that I've done. And I wanted to use an unconventional type of way to do them. So you will see I've used resin tint, which is very similar to acrylic, which we're probably all familiar with, with paper marbling. Then, as I love nail varnish, <laughs> and it's just wonderfully there, I couldn't help but use nail varnish. So I tried it with acetone, and it just looked so good on the water. And I played around with it using different colours, and I just thought, this is amazing and it's so wonderful to um, see happening because you put the sort of nail varnish in but then you have no control of the finished result it's completely left you know to to chance really in that sense and i like that because as artists we like to control the whole process but here you're part of the beginning of it but not the end outcome and so I've also used food colouring, it's perfect timing. Food colouring, um, obviously That's we are foodies. <laughs> with the food colouring, I just stuck with primary colours. So yellow, blue and red. Just sticking with those colours to see what I create. Mm. And it was really, really oh, nice. Yeah. You use shaving foam and it smelt gorgeous. When you say you use shaving foam, Oh, <laughs> Would you like to just explain what you mean by that? <laughs> so this is where the men, and I like to, you know, hopefully I'm going to do a workshop here. It's all really intrigued the men. You can actually use shaving foam. So as I said, unconventional methods. 
and you just spray it all out. You have to buy quite a lot of it though. <laughs> and then you sort of place randomly the food colouring and you can get a toothpick or a, you know an old pen and just create different swirls. And you don't have to be a professional paper marbler to do this. And again, it's about demystifying. You know, I'm, I haven't, I've been on one professional marbling course, I'll put it out there, but that's it, just one. And already with these methods, I just feel free to, to try, you know, different ones. My favourite, I think, the resin tint looked very nice, but was the spray paint, using spray paint. I stuck with secondary colours. Who knows the secondary colours? Shout them out. Green. Yes. Purple. Orange. Purple, yes. And orange. Ha. So I thought, let me categorise the spray paint section with prime, secondary, sorry, colours. And it just, it came out, you know, the army, sort of, the army camouflage. camouflage. That was how it came out, and I loved it. And it resonates with men, because I've had the opportunity to see people walk around and I ask them, which ones? And a lot of the men. I think it's like stunning, that. the resin tint Which is, is nice. <laughs> also a bit, a bit like peacock feathers mm. as well, the eyes and the peacock yes. feather. And just to note, I have incorporated traditional marbling methods um, in terms of, with some of them, so I've used a stone where you just literally flick the, the substance on the water, but there's other methods you can use as well. But one of my favourites and easiest was just the stone, the stone one. Absolutely is, stunning results. Let's get gal, there's all different types of... <laughs> and, and everybody will be having a go in your workshops, which I'm, I'm afraid for you, they're almost sold out, so we don't have any places left. <laughs> so popular in Victoria's workshops. It's fascinating, Victoria, absolutely incredible to see the journey you've come on. I just wondered if anybody had any questions for Victoria whilst she's here. Yes. We were talking earlier about the shapes of fans. Maybe we should have somebody give the lady a... I'll just speak up. <laughs> so we were... We were talking earlier about the shapes of fans and you've got the unusual innovative shape and we wondered whether it's possible to make a square fan, you know, because you're thinking about it's, mm. the physics will be complicated. Very good question. But could you? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Very good question. I've seen um, a squared shape ish fan. I've seen it. It can be, everything is possible, absolutely so. Um, I might have to have a try of it. What you will see. Yeah is with the marbled papers that I've done, I've used the modern design. But I haven't yet thought about actually changing the shape so it's not that typical moon um, sort of arch traditional shape, but changing. I haven't thought of that. That might be the next step. And this is why it's so good to... Geometric fan making. Yes. Right? I love it. It's so good to have this conversation with you because you guys have ideas that I haven't thought about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really Thank interesting. You. Anybody else got a question, Victoria? We've got uh, two more questions. Um, so what are some of the major differences in types of fans, not only from country to country, but continent to continent and different centuries as well? Oh, that's a big question. Yes. Well, we HD in fan making, please, Victoria. <laughs> There's a saying that fans are as old as hot weather. We can't actually date back the very, very first fan that was ever made. But history does tell us that the fixed fan, sort of the one that's roundish, many people say the lollipop shape, but the technical term is a fixed fan, starts in Egypt, Alexandria of Egypt. Uh, yeah. Um, where you see the pharaohs. Apparently many fixed fans were found in the burial chambers of Tutankhamun. There's this whole sort of ritual of burying um, you know, well-prestiged people with a fan to revive their spirit. 
Um, and also in Asia, so when we think of um, India, for example, they also have fixed fans called the punka. Anybody know that? Yeah. The punka is a very specific design of fans. Um, and they use all types of um, materials like cotton, tassels, mirrors. It's very elaborate, very rich in textiles, you'll see. Um, and in Africa, so for example in Nigeria, where my family's from, we have chief dancy fans, fixed fans. And they're used by the chiefs of the villages and of the towns, and it will have your name on them. And it's a special way of showing who you are. So you can imagine... It's a status symbol. Absolutely. So I would say certain continents have fixed fans. The folding fan starts from Japan with the um, obsession of origami. <laughs> and also with the animal's wing. They really studied the mechanism of how animal's wings opens and closes. And they thought, hmm, this creates a wind. It's very interesting when I studied these things. We can make this into a mechanism device that can help us in hot weather. And it was taken to China through Korea, but actually the folding fan is a Japanese art. And we all know the kimono dress, those who love fashion, yes. like yourself. The kimono is also from that animal's wing as well. So Japan started the folding fan, and also in Europe, the Portuguese brought the folding fan to England um, through the monarchs and those in aristocracy, as you said, a huge status symbol. And if you research Queen Elizabeth I, she was always seen um, with a fan in her paintings, huge, huge status symbol. Yes, yes. Absolutely yeah. astonishing. <laughs> what, what knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria. That's really interesting. Got time for one more question. I think we have one here. I think we have two. Maybe. Oh, two. <laughs> Gary's got a question as well. Oh, Three questions. Well, of course we can. We can fit them all in. Yeah, it's about materials, because you were talking about textiles, and I, mean, I guess you can use natural materials as well. So how is the, because you do it in paper primarily, have you thought about kind of experimenting with different kind of materials and different ways of putting them together? Absolutely. That's where I failed Victoria with my beginner's sewing class. <laughs> so that will be my next fate, as well as thinking of different shapes of fans, is to actually study a lot more depth fabric fans and so I will be taking some months out later this year to really study lace, um, not just how to apply lace, but maybe making my own lace fans, and also different types of African Ankara, which Mary Jane is wonderfully yeah. modelling. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's actually called Dutch wax. It's actually a Dutch um, invention that the, you know, West Africans love but to experiment using Dutch wax on fabric, that's my next stage. But it's really important, I think, in our world and in society, being sustainable. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I love and I'm very proud of is that my fans, the majority of them are vegan, and I teach that. Vegan woods, vegan glues, vegan papers, and handmade as well. So I think because of the ways in which our world is going, I can tick that box off for my business. So, oh, particularly with the fashion industry, which is one of the biggest polluters in, in, in the world. So I think that's really brilliant. Your and recyclable papers too. I love recyclable papers. And when I said to Victoria, what's going to happen to all the leftover food? She said, we've come armed with Tupperware. <laughs> that to me is, is, is a real tick. <laughs> interested in the language of fans. Um, um, when you did the television program with Alan Titchmarsh, you talked a little yes, about Yes, Victoria then. was a star on Something yeah. now? Yeah. Yes, Victoria was on, on Alan Titchmarsh's show very recently. Can, you, yeah. can people still see know. that, Victoria? Yeah. Can they download it from YouTube? Yes, if you download ITVX, the app, you just need to search for episode 
So sorry, series five, episode 22. So I say to people, five, two. You should be able to see. You just need to put in your email address and create a password. And the full episode is there. But it's such a good question, the language of fans, because wasn't the certainly in certain areas there was the way you held your fan, the way you were shyly covered by your fan, all yeah. sorts of different things. You know, it's weird because even so in the Regency period, just at the end, we bleed into the Victorian period. And in that transition, fans needed to be revived even then. It's very strange, and history is happening and again. And one of the ways they did that was to create the language of the fan. So there's no real academic evidence that the language was real, because if it's an unspoken language, the people you're trying to communicate with would need to know every single movement of the language. But it was a romanticised way of portraying ladies, in high society, and there's some novels that you can find. I think Jane Austen novel. Lady Windermere's fan. Lady Windermere's fan. For example, yeah. So it worked. Believe you me, that was the PR back then. Huge. Mm -hmm. um, and women, in particularly in those days, it was very, very. It was a must that you have a suitor, and you would use your fan to communicate your interest. And it was a great icebreaker also to introduce yourself. And there's, I think on the right cheek is yes, the left cheek is no. And then, you know, we shall be friends. You know, let's have a little word, you know. And there's this wonderful, I think it's called something like the alphabet fan, where the lady on the leaf would have the alphabet to sort of one to a hundred on the fan. And then you would use your finger and point out, so I love you. Oh, the oh. And the more well, I don't love you. Yes. <laughs> but many ladies said, you know, let's meet someone. And you would point on the fan to the number. This thing is so interesting. <laughs> But there's so many variations of the language of the fan. If you Google it, you'll see. But the language of the fan that I prefer to go by is by Duvelois, a French fan-making company who um, created the scroll of the language of the fan. And when you would purchase a fan from them, you would receive the scroll to master and try out your new language of the fan. But now you would see Mary Jane, all sorts of silly things people have created and put it onto Wikipedia and Google. Where can we find the original <laughs> Delois if you scroll? Go, yes, if you go online and just type in language of the fan du Belois, um, you will see. Uh, it's very, very, <laughs> it's very interesting. But you have to have a fan, so it's encouraging you. This is all... As you say, it was a fantastic PR of, of yes. the time. That's right. Um, who else has got the question? We've got um, one more. One more. Anybody else wants to, to ask? So, Gary, would you like... Was it, so, is it... Uh, my, Gary, go, go ahead. My original question was going to be about the material fan. And did Mary Jane actually teach you how to do a material <laughs> fan? But then my brain started drifting off into the pleats and thinking that Scotland has its own fan, which is the kilt, and if you ever need to get a breath of fresh air, you just mm. laugh it. <laughs> but I would be really interested in having a tartan fan. Mm. Lightweight tartan oh. material on a fan would be really yeah. masculine and, well, asexual, but, yeah, you know, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. This is what I love, because on the fan, I have this saying, all things are possible. You know, we're finding the way to freedom, releasing it to new ways. Mm -hmm. This is it. And of course, again, yes, you said the pleats of the fan. I was at Folk by the Oak last year, and we actually did tartan design fans. So it's actually been done. We did <laughs> a tartan design. Yeah, was there. We, didn't, we didn't make one last year. So it's incredible, but this is it. It's that same energy, that same idea, that way of thinking. We feel the same way. And you can put anything on the camera. 
I just see it as like a painting, just like you say. Anything can go on the canvas. I love your slogan, fanning the way to freedom. <laughs> Victoria, it's been an absolute joy speaking to you this evening. I, I feel like I've had a world tour, whirlwind yeah. tour of fan making, yeah. not only throughout centuries, but around the world. It's been really interesting talking to you. Um, for those of you who don't live in Kidbrook, uh, you can see Victoria's work at Made in Greenwich. And she'll be on there from Wednesday the 11th of October until Wednesday the 1st of November. Um, Woolwich Front Room, our project on Power Street, she'll be exhibiting from the 24th of August to the 12th of September. And here at Kidbrook until the 9th of August. Um, it's been a wonderful evening, Victoria. Congratulations again. Let's give her a round of applause. Victoria. I would like to also just thank for me the Royal Borough of Greenwich for their continued support and releasing this wonderful idea with the GCDA. The GC, the Greenwich Cooperative Development Agency, mean business. They mean what they say. They are an incredible team of people in front of the screens, behind the screens, really for the community, not just artists, but for all people of the community. And they are such a wonderful asset to the borough of Greenwich. Thank, thank you, you so much for all your help and your intelligence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'd also like to thank my family because they have really been with me through thick and thin. Behind the scenes, they are advocates of Greenwich. They love the virus so much. And I'd also like to thank all of you for coming today. All of you, you're all wonderful and you're all part of my journey. And we're all connected by Greenwich. We've all had a connection to Greenwich. <laughs> so thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, Victoria. Thank you.